well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll introduce myself again in a second, but I'm very pleased to be here. So, let me move down. So first, I want to thank Marv for hosting this webinar. It's always exciting to get a chance to talk about what we do and hopefully to share some good ideas. And, you know, I'd love to hear back some, some good advice from the audience. So looking forward to questions, looking forward to ideas, that sort of thing. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, covering the challenge of accounting, for measuring for marketing, understanding what's going on. Um, marketing is obviously a really important part of business. And, you know, we, we, can all, we all know the sort of Drucker type quotes, you know, there's only sort of two aspects of business that are really important. And so sort of marketing is one of them, you know, getting the customer, understanding the customer. These are all crucial things, but it's very, very hard to measure. I think we'd all agree on that. And so we're going to talk today about the challenge of measuring marketing and how to understand it. Um, but my aim is to give you, um, you know, some way to improve your use of measure, metrics and measurement. And then more generally to promote better measurement of marketing to get these ideas across, you know, that however hard it is, and believe me, it's super hard to measure marketing. Um, that said, you know, we can do a better job than we're doing at the moment. So, um, thank you, got an excellent introduction. So you all, you all know about me by now. Uh, I'm Neil Bendel, I'm a Associate Professor of Marketing at the Ivy Business School, Western University. Uh, that's in London, Ontario. So many of you won't know London, Ontario, but it's an exciting place. Um, I, as you know, the more, Sort of people with better with accents will realise I'm not Canadian uh, initially. Um, I'm from London, England, but I'm now in London, Ontario, which is a, a nice change, a bit confusing for everyone, obviously. Uh, I'm an accountant by background, um, where I worked uh, sort of in uh, in uh, KPMG and, and hospital and and the Labour Party for a while. So I, I'm I'm used to sort of coming from the accounting side, so I understand the measurement issues. And a lot of when I talk about the problems with accounting later. You know, it comes from an understanding that accounting is not easy. I'm not uh, anti-accounting in any way whatsoever. Um, PhD from Minnesota. Um, so, again, my main objective with coming to North America from England was to get better weather. And I managed to go to uh, uh, Minnesota and, and Canada. Uh, and that's clearly some, some for people who know those, lots of snow can be a bit challenging. Uh, MBA from Darden and Virginia. Um, so I've watched a lot with colleagues at Virginia, we'll talk a bit about that. And my initial background is though history, which I think is quite helpful. Uh, and I'll explain perhaps a tiny bit why. It, you know, it gives you, an, you know, the idea of thinking through things, coming at things from different angles. So very much when I, when I approach research, when I approach ideas, when I approach how to help managers, you know, one of the things I try and do is bring like a fresh perspective, something different. Uh, and I think hopefully I'm relatively good at doing that. Um, things to note, just things you might be interested in what we've done. Probably the, the most um, well known is the Marketing Metrics book. This is now in its third edition uh, with Paul and Phil and Dave. Uh, Paul and Phil are um, at Darden uh, uh, and Dave's in, in Wharton School. Um, it's been a very popular book. We've been very pleased at how it's been done. Lots of uh, managers have adopted it. Lots of course uh, classes and schools have adopted it too. Uh, it's just a very sort of um, hopefully a clear way of going through what marketing metrics there are <laughs> and as many of you will know there's tons of marketing metrics uh, we originally uh, what we thought rather amusingly wrote 50 plus because it was too hard to count them and uh, some people thought that was that was unusual because it was a, a metrics book about numbering but we were just being funny um, so other work I've got sort of more more recent sort of more academic work um, I've got a paper with uh, Shin uh, Wang, Shane Wang, um, called Marketing Accounts, which is actually freely available. So some, um, the Canadian government were nice enough to pay for it to put it open access. So anyone's welcome to go online and read that paper. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about the ideas in that paper later. Um, also, um, I've got a paper in Sloan with Charon Bagger, uh, and Charon and I were looking at mistakes that marketers make in their, in their use of metrics. And so again, one of the things we're going to be doing is talking through that paper in a little bit too, or some of the ideas, a couple of the ideas in there, not all of them. Um, and then also, me and Sharon had a paper on um, the confusion about customer lifetime value. So you'll see, I'll, I'll talk about how customer lifetime value is a bit confused. Uh, and I think that's going to be important um, to just understand 
where we're coming from and why I say marketing is poorly measured. Um, there's some, there's some um, challenging ways of looking at marketing out there, some ideas that don't seem to make sense, to be honest. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so in this webinar, I'll outline the challenges with measuring marketing. And I'm going to show how marketers abuse metrics. So I'm going to talk about what the mistakes they make. And then um, on a bit more positive note, I'm going to suggest how you can choose metrics appropriately. You know, um, yes, there's going to be challenges. Yes, people will make mistakes. But if you come back and sit at it and you kind of think, you know, what am I trying to achieve with this metric? Then you're more likely to um, come up with a better, better use of metric than if you don't. Uh, I'll also highlight the problems with the way marketing is accounted for. And this is one of the themes that you'll see in some of my work now, that this idea that marketing's uh, suffering from the way it's accounted for. Um, there's reasons for that, and we'll discuss those. Um, but it is a bit of a challenge. Um, what we're also going to do, though, is describe MASB's work to improve this. So again, I like to like give you a problem and then give you at least some working towards the solution. Um, and MASB, the Marketing Accountability Standards Board, I'll talk a little bit more about their work and the work we're doing uh, to try and improve the way marketing is accounted for. And, and then again, I'll give you some more sort of practical ideas on what you can do today to improve accounting for marketing. You don't need to wait for everyone else to uh, do, do stuff. Um, so the agenda today, misuse of metrics, number one. Choosing the right metrics, number two. And then external accounting for marketing, uh, that's financial accounting, to, um, you might be a more familiar term. Um, MASB, uh, we'll discuss, then counter marketing internally, and then the conclusions and the next steps. So first, the misuse of uh, metrics. So do marketers misuse metrics? Well, sadly, yes, is the pretty clear answer on that one. Marketers do often tend to misuse their metrics. Um, how do they do this? How do they abuse their metrics? Well, one sort of very common, personally I find particularly galling, uh, irritating um, way of marketers do it is when they talk about the bottom line, which, you know, generally basically means profit. Um, uh, but they, and they talk, they talk about the bottom line, but when they actually, what they actually mean is the top line revenue. So people often tend to confuse revenue and profit. And honestly, it's, it's a problem. Um, uh, Revenue is important to measure. And one of the things I don't want anyone to get the impression is that I believe that you know, there's, we should only look at one number and the one number is the only thing we should do. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is you know, we need to be really careful about the claims we're making. We need to be clear. If we mean profit, we should say profit. If we mean revenue, we should say revenue. You know, just be absolutely clear. Um, now, having revenue goals isn't necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, we need to know that, you know, a revenue goal is different to a profit goal. Um, so be careful about the claims marketers make. Uh, we can't build marketing's credibility with incorrect me me uh, metrics and dubious assertions. So if we're saying something that's, um, uh, you know, either incorrect or a bit, bit sort of not credible, uh, this isn't going to do a great job of making marketing uh, look like the you know, the crucial element of business that we know it is. So let me outline two major errors I've seen recently. And some of these are coming from, from Sloan, some, some of them are coming from the paper in uh, the Customer Lifetime Value Paper in uh, Marketing Education Review. Um, customer Lifetime Value. Uh, for those who don't know Customer Lifetime Value, you don't need to know the calculation to follow what I'm saying. Customer Lifetime Value is just basically a way of trying to put some sort of estimate of the value of a customer. Customer, customer relationships are the lifeblood of many firms. And, you know, we'll see this. You can think of many companies that do this. Um, you know, a classic would be banks might give you a free gift to, to become a, a customer of their bank. And quite often these gifts are quite, are quite nice. You know, they can, can go to the like iPads, that sort of thing. Um, and that's nice. And you're not going to get that back in fees from a customer in you know in a couple of weeks or a couple of months um, these things often take long time so the so the incentives the bank's paying for you know buying the ipad is going to be a short-term net negative cash outflow it's a cost uh, it's a cost of going out of the, the firm but 
the, the those sort of incentives only really make sense when they're justified by a long-term relationship being created. So you might, you know, give an iPad to a student, but the hope is that that student banks with you for many years to come. And yeah, eventually you see the money back because the customer, the student comes in, you know, and hopefully they might not be earning a lot of money now, but they are later and they bank with you and, and lots of good things happen. So, you know, the idea is you give a short term, a, sh a short term incentive and it brings back in the long term. But what we want to know, obviously, is, you know, how much is that long term worth? Um, well, um, that, that's a really important question. And that question is going to give you some idea of how much to spend on acquiring customers. You don't want to give iPads out to customers who, um, who, who just aren't going to pay back in the long term. How much to spend on retention? You know, how much should, should a company be spending to try and make sure they've got their current customers and keep them? Uh, developing customers. You might look at some customers and think, you know, that, that customer um, is very similar to customers who are very good customers. You know, why isn't that customer behaving like they're very good customers? Um, they look as though they, they should be a very valuable customer. And think, you, know, you think through about ways that you might improve their service or generally uh, develop them, make them better customers. Um, um, decide when to fire a customer. Firing is often a sort of very emotive term. So I kind of put it in here because it's in the literature. But by firing, people don't mean sort of you know, calling up the customer and being uh, nasty. They generally mean sort of just, you know, stepping back from the relationship a bit, giving, you know, not being as aggressive of keeping that customer, that sort of thing. Um, and the value of a firm. So often, if you think of a firm, in some ways a firm can be valued as a, a sort of group of customer relationships. And there's a bunch of academic literature on this, and anyone's interested, give me a shout. But um, there's, if you see the firm as a group of customer relationships, then when we put it all together, we can get some idea of the value of a firm. Obviously, firms are very, very, very complicated to value. So I'm not saying this is a, a complete or a, the only thing, the only way you should do this. But you know, one thing we can use customer lifetime value is to understand the value of the firm. So we've got five things that customer value might be used for: acquiring customers, spend, uh, spending on retention, developing customers, deciding who to who to keep, who to fire and then firm valuation. So what are those five things? Remember those five things. Um, so these are the goals. One thing I will say is that value must be based upon some sort of profit. And technically, contribution is usually the best way of looking at this, but we won't, we won't worry about that too much. Um, some wrongly use revenue as a basis, sales fee basis. So if someone tells you the value of a customer is based upon revenue, this is problematical because costs do matter. Uh, other things that people don't uh, put, do wrong is um, that they don't discount their cash flows. And this is really important. So again, I'm not sure how financy everyone is in the audience, um, but discounting is important. And, and the, you know, the logic, the intuition is pretty um, easy to understand. You know, if, if I'm going to get, you know, $100 today, that's great. Offer me $100 in 10 years time, and that's a lot less valuable partially for inflation, partly for sort of risk type um, reasons. Um, so we need to start discounting our cash flows. Marketers need to discount cash flows if they want to be taken seriously by finance people who do generally uh, discount every cash flow they have. Um, but those are, those are fairly common mistakes. They're common across a number of different metrics. What I really want to do is talk about this subtracting acquisition costs from CLV before reporting it. So what sometimes people do is imagine a customer costs hundred dollars to acquire, and their life and, and over their lifetime as a customer, they two hundred dollars gets netted in, fully discounted. We've done all that, so I just want to make the numbers easy. So you're two hundred, they cost a hundred. Um, that's great. Now, what's that customer worth? Um, some people say, well, you brought in two hundred dollars. It costs you 100 to get, so the customer's worth 100. Okay, you can see the logic of that. The problem with that is once they're a customer, that $100 you spend getting them is irrelevant. You've already spent it. You're not getting it back. So their actual worth is $200. And people don't often, people often miss this. Uh, and so t subtracting the um, acquisition cost from Sylvie before reporting it 
um, you can argue for it in the case of acquisition um, when acquisi when acquiring customers when you're looking forward and trying to decide who to acquire but once you've already acquired it it doesn't make sense at all to worry about acquisition costs so four of those five aims that I showed before the ones I'm talking about are retention development firing and valuation all the numbers go horribly wrong if you take off acquisition costs uh, but people make these mistakes very commonly because they don't really understand what they're doing with the metrics. Um, so what I'm finding is that many, many, many people, professors, marketers, don't understand the metrics they use. And if you don't understand the metrics you use, then um, um, you can you have problems uh, coming to the right numbers. You know, if you base your retention decisions upon a faulty number, uh, your business isn't going isn't gonna to run particularly well at all. So another, another mistake I'd like to do is um, talk about um, uh, valuation of social media. Um, so we sometimes value social media likes. And we see measures of these that are problematic in their usage. Um, so the value of a social media like might be the value of a like on social media equals the value of a customer who likes on social media minus the value of a customer who doesn't like on social media. Very simple, you know, a customer who likes you Spends three hundred dollars uh, um, has a value. Sorry, has a value of three hundred dollars. Um, the customer who doesn't like you has a value of one hundred dollars. Um, so someone says the value of a like on social media is two hundred dollars. Um, don't use revenue for value, of course. Um, but but what does that value mean? What's that two hundred dollars mean? Um, some suggest, um, usually a bit cheapishly that marketers should be willing to spend up to that $200 to get a social media like. But this shows a complete lack of theoretical understanding of the metric. The value of the like that I've just described shows the difference between two groups. But it does not show what caused it. And as marketers, we're really interested in what causes things. So um, people who like a brand on social media do so because they, um, they have some sort of affinity. You know, uh, uh, you know, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I like Rice Krispie cereal. I, I like it because I like Rice Krispie cereal, and that's the reason why I press the like button on social media. Um, the very fact that I pressed the like button wasn't the thing that caused me to like Rice Krispie cereal. And so spending to gain likes, so essentially getting people who don't like or don't eat Rice Krispie cereal, paying them to like you on social media, doesn't make them the same as someone who spontaneously decided to like it on social media. So the, the new likers are not the same as those liked previously. And therefore, it doesn't make sense to base your social media spending strategy upon that, on that difference, because you, that's a, the social media strategy isn't gonna cause that difference. So there's a couple of things I kind of wanna emphasize there. Just the theoretical understanding, and I'll talk more about theory in a second, um, but just all I basically mean is you know, what, what causes it, what's it do? Um, so choosing the right metrics. So given many marketers choose inappropriately, what metrics do I recommend? This seems like a reasonable question. What, what, um, what metrics do I recommend to do? Well, this is going to depend upon your goal. And I'm not going to suggest any particular metric here. I'm not going to say, hey, this is a magical metric. Lots of people suggest net promoter seems to be a magical metric. Um, seems a little, a little incorrect to me, but whatever. Um, but... Um, there isn't a magical metric out there, uh, but there are better metrics that can be used for better things. Uh, some metrics are better um, uh, related to what you're trying to achieve. So the way, first thing to do is going to say, you understand what each metric does. Uh, you need to understand a metric to know whether you're going to use it properly. And for this, you must use a, st a standard terminology. Everyone who's using the metric must know what the metric means and must use all the same things. So I'm going to talk about the Common Language Marketing Dictionary in a second and think through the metric before adopting its usage. I've got a model um, called the Waiter Model. Uh, I was attempting to be amusing there, talking about helping you decide. So we've got a waiter. Um, but this helps you decide what marketing metrics to use. So I'm going to talk through these two things. So, so first, let me talk about Common Language. Marketers often fail to agree on meaning, and this is a big problem in marketing. Brand means different things to different people. Um, so brand valuations vary substantially because people are trying to measure different things. 
but which makes it really hard to convince non-marketers that brand matters because they see one valuation that's you know two billion one valuation that's six billion and they kind of think well i don't you know where these numbers coming from um so marketing will benefit if people use common terms and so masby i'll talk a little bit more later are working with partners to build a common marketing language um and so i've got the I've got the partners down there, the ANA, AMA, MSI, so Marketing Science, uh, um, National Advertisers, and the American Marketing Association. Uh, these are all um, you know, key marketing organizations, um, and they're behind this project. Um, and you can find it at www.marketingdictionary.org. So people could look on that, you know, and if you want to know a term, and it's a wide range of different terms, it's not just metrics, but, you know, obviously from my perspective, the metrics are the kind of most exciting ones. Um, you know, you're going to find out a lot of marketing terms there. It's very helpful if we all use the same term. When we say something, I know what it means, you know what it means because we're using the same terms. So what's my waiter model? The five questions of the waiter model for deciding which metric to use are, who will use the metric? This is a fairly obvious question. Um, you know, you need to understand, you know, who, who wants to use it. And there's typically quite a big difference between what the CEO wants to know and what sort of a, a marketing analyst will want to know. These are different people. They need different things. So, you know, they probably need to choose a metric at sort of obviously at probably a higher level aggregation for the CEO, but also sometimes just look at different things. And what are the assumptions behind the metrics? So not every metric to sense in has has some sort of assumptions behind it, some more than others. Uh, and if, if they do, then, you know, understand them, be clear, um, know when, you know, when these assumptions apply and when they don't. Um, uh, the, the risk of, um, you know, we'll call, for the sake of argument, we'll call CLV a metric. Maybe probably not 100% accurate term, but we'll, we'll run with that. Um, let's assume um, we look at the assumptions behind CLV, customer lifetime value, and some of them are quite restrictive. You know, so if you use a formula, you tend to need a regular payment and understand these sort of things. It doesn't make it bad. It does mean that you've got to understand it in order to use it effectively. So what are the ingredients? The sources of the data. And I think sometimes marketers don't get into these details enough. Uh, they kind of might think it's an IT problem or something like that. But, you know, if your data's coming from different sources, if your data's got problems, then your metrics aren't going to be very good. So you need to understand the source of the data. You need to know where it's coming from, what it means. Um, uh, what's the theory behind this idea? And I use the term theory, and I realize that whenever I'm talking to managers, theory can sometimes be, you know, let's say, uh, I'll say a bad word almost. Um, and I don't mean it in some sort of very sort of pompous academic idea of theory. I just mean, why, why does this make sense? You know, give me a reasonable causal story about why this would make sense. And if you can't come up with any reasonable story at all, then I'm very dubious about about it to say the least so you know very sort of might say small t theory uh, by which i just mean you know the theory doesn't need to be grand it doesn't need to have big words it just needs to be a causes b you know we think this spending will cause people to do this um and what actions do i take once i know the score and that's really important with metrics the last thing we want to do is start calculating metrics where no one knows why we're calculating just for, you know, just for the sake of calculating metrics. So we need to know what actions can I take once I know the score and knowing in advance. So I'm thinking about doing, you know, using the weight model in advance. So think in advance about what you're going to do with the number before you bother calculating it. Well, let's talk about the external accounting for marketing. Um, deals in the news uh, headlines aren't typical. <laughs> Certainly they aren't typical but they can help illuminate problems. Um, so for instance, um, there's been a decent amount of press recently about Whole Foods being taken over by Amazon um, and the beard, whatever, some 14 billion, something like that. Um, you know, a huge amount of money. But if you actually look at the Whole Foods annual report, the shareholders equity, i.e. what's what the company's worth to the shareholders is, is you know, about a quarter of that, a bit less than a quarter of that. 
Now, that seems very odd, doesn't it? Coming, you know, coming from an external, uh, just coming completely fresh and saying, the accounting saying that this firm's worth, say, 3 billion, people are willing to pay 14 billion for it. You know, that's, that's a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of difference between it. So was Amazon simply making a mistake? Well, you know, with, that, with any takeover, I, I always hesitate to, to give any thoughts really in advance, and I'm not endorsing or unendorsing or think it's good, better, indifferent. But, you know, the fact that 14 billion is bigger than 3 billion is not evidence of a mistake, uh, is the best way of putting it. Um, Whole Foods accounting records miss an awful lot of what makes Whole Foods a valuable company. Essentially, you know, one thing we've got there is the Whole Foods brand. Whole Foods is a very strong brand. I, you know, I don't know how many uh, people have, um, have shopped at Whole Foods, but it's got a very sort of unique vibe. And it's got, you know, a, a very strong brand and a strong, very strong presence. This is kind of what makes it valuable. Uh, but very little of that's been captured in, in external reporting. So what is going on? Well, there's a couple of problems with the way accounting for marketing is done. So let's think of sort of two generic types of marketing. Um, one, which is marketing designed for an immediate return. And kind of think of that, think of credit card offers. So you get a credit card mailing in the post that says, you know, please return this envelope and we'll give you a new credit card. Uh, you know, with that, um, you expect to see a pretty quick turnaround. Um, you know, it, the, the offers will all come back. You know, all the responses should be expected within, say, a month or whatever. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're designed for an immediate return. But there's another type of marketing um, that is designed for a much longer term benefit. And you know, the classic example of this is brand building advertising. So when Coca-Cola does its advertising, it doesn't necessarily think you're all gonna run out and buy uh, Coca-Cola the next, the next uh, afternoon. But it kind of just wants to leave you with a sort of warm glow of feeling for Coke in the long term. Um, so that's brand building advertising. And that is really quite different to the immediate uh, return sort of uh, spending that might be on the credit card office, the direct mails office, that sort of thing. So despite the different aims of most, most marketing, um, despite the, its different aims, most marketing spending is treated actually quite similar. It's typically treated as an expense, which means it's immediately charged as a cost. Um, no asset is created despite the fact that marketers' intention, uh, uh, they're trying to create a long-term invest, investment and this is a problem. So you've got two different types of spending, one designed to create an immediate return, one designed to create a long-term return, and they're, they're treated the same. But the accounting concept of matching is the idea that um, costs, uh, you know, the, the revenues and expenses to generate them should hit the accounts in the same time. Now that's fine for the credit card offer because it was designed to create an immediate return. You know, the spending goes out, the revenue comes in, in the same period, a couple of weeks afterwards, we're good to go. But the longer term benefit, the brand building advertising, is actually a problem. Because the brand building costs are being charged this year, and the benefits might be felt next year, the year after, three years time, whenever. So, so the problem is, um, this, is a, this is not actually how accounting is supposed to work. Um, brand building costs are charged in an earlier period than the benefits are received. Um, uh, so, so this also means that um, there's another problem that occurs for, um, for accounting marketing is that um, the, the spending when it's done in-house building up a, building up a, um, a brand or uh, other types of marketing asset um, tend to be treated as an expense if they're spent in-house. But if they're bought, then... Um, then um, this is different, this is treated differently because the act of purchase means that someone has valued that brand in some way. And so the accountants will put them on the balance sheet. So if, if, I, if, I, if I built the, you know, if, um, if a company built the, um, the thing in-house, it'd be treated one way, and if, if it was um, bought, it'd be treated another way. And these are reasons why the market, market value of a firm, i.e. roughly what it would cost to buy the firm, is coming completely out of whack uh, with 
the book value of the firm, what accountants are reporting. Because accountants aren't reporting a lot of the important things that it takes to, to uh, run a firm. And the problems from an accounting's perspective discussed. So if anyone wants a, a good book to read, um, Levin Goo's The End of Accounting, The Path Forward for Investors and Managers is a very interesting uh, recent book. Um, so we're suggesting that this leads to underinvestment in marketing. Um, so what the problem is, so as I was mentioning earlier, so Kellogg Company reports the value of the Pringles brand because it bought Pringles, but it internally generated the Frosties brand and it doesn't report them. So, that, so you get this bizarre situation where some brands are reported, many brands aren't, and it, the only difference is some sort of historical difference about when they were bought, when they were generated internally. In the year that happens, maybe there's a difference. But you know, when someone was bought 10 years ago or internally generated 10 years ago, you know, it, it doesn't really matter to the, to the reader of the financial statements, but obviously there is a difference there. Um, so I'd say the current situation isn't great. Uh, that's a sort of Frosty's reference if people know they're Frosty's advertising. Um, so essentially the way accounts, financial accounting is dealing with marketing is a bit of an illogical mess at the moment. Um, I will, you know, okay, so I'm an accountant as background, I will sort of slightly defend accounting and say it's very hard. So uh, I think many accountants might even agree with me saying it's a mess, but suggest that this is the best mess that they can think of. Um, I, I think we can do a little better, but whatever, we'll, we'll talk, that's not really what I'm talking about today. Uh, but it, it, is, it is a problem the way accounting treats marketing at the moment. Um, and, and the worry for marketers essentially is that failing to account for uh, marketing properly leads to underinvestment in marketing. Marketing seems expensive because, you know, it's charged as a cost when it happens, despite the fact the intention behind much of it is to create an asset. So what can we do about it? Well, let me turn now to MASB. MASB is the Marketing Accountability Standards Board. Um, it's got a mission to establish marketing measurement and accountability standards across industry of continuous improvement in financial pro performance and to guide and educate business decision makers and users of performance of financial information. So there's a ton of really interesting and important uh, companies involved and organizations, uh, GM, Pepsi, Nielsen, S.C. Johnson, there's a, you can see a bunch of them down there. Um, and uh, many of them, the sort of uh, more interesting um, schools in the world, Columbia and Wharton and Northwestern and things. Um, I chair the MASB advisory group. And so what, you know, so I can kind of talk a little bit through about what MASB are trying to do and why this might be helpful. Well, well MASB is trying to un undertake a bunch of projects um, to, to establish some sort of clear guidance on the measurement of marketing. And these include uh, a common language project, We've already mentioned that, that's the marketing dictionary. Uh, please do use that, go to it. Improving financial reporting. So this is, um, the, pro the idea behind this project is to supply advice on how best to account for marketing. Um, hopefully interesting stuff. A lot of that talks back to the slides that I've just covered on, on the problems with accounting for marketing. We're also putting together a finance and marketing course that's gonna be freely available fairly soon. Um, uh, to improve the teaching of marketing finance. And this, this idea, we've got a bunch of projects, we talk about how marketing and finance are taught together. Um, there's also, uh, there's a bunch of other projects. So another one just to highlight is the Brand Investment Evaluation Project to understand how, the, uh, how investments in brand make a difference and how we can value it. Um, so do visit the MASB website, which is just uh, themasb.org uh, to, to learn more about that. So please, please go there. Accounting for marketing internally. Um, so what else do I want to say? Well, a lot of I've highlighted so far are problems with the way marketing's accounted for externally. So this is the things that the financial accountants are going to tell you about what things they must do because of financial accounting rules. And a lot of that, you know, a lot of what they say is, is true. Some of the th things they really must do because of financial accounting rules. What can we do though? What can we do today? Um, certainly, we you know can try and influence financial accounting rules, but you know we can't just unilaterally decide on what the account, financial accounting rules should be. But we can actually have a lot more influence on internal reporting. Um, so, as I say, financial accounting rules often give little flexibility to accountants for external reporting. Often, typically, they must treat marketing as expense. 
you know, whatever the actual accountant thought, you could persuade the accountant that what you were doing was a fantastic investment in marketing. It wouldn't matter. They'd still have to, to often treat it as an expense. Um, yeah, oh, the problem we see is not necessarily, well, I mean, the, how financial accounting is, is treated is a problem. But, but I think it goes further than that. Um, financial accounting rules have a wider impact than just uh, external reporting. We actually find that external rules are often followed in internal reporting, despite not being designed to apply to internal reports. So we did a quick informal survey of accountants. We found that they often base their internal reports on external reporting rules. So because something was an external reporting rule, they would generate their internal reports uh, to be consistent with the external reports. And the problem is, um, that is actually not very helpful. And I'll explain why. And think about the users of internal and external reports. Um, the external reports are designed for, um, um, you know, people who are going to invest in the company, people who are going to lend to the company, that sort of thing. These are people who are outsiders looking in. The internal reports are designed for managers. So insiders. Now, there's a whole host of different problems for insiders as outsiders. The outsiders essentially don't want to be tricked. They don't want to be conned. The insiders actually just want to make good decisions. Um, so what we've got is this idea that um, external rules, which are designed to stop people tricking other people, that sort of thing, at the risk of being too simplistic, um, are influencing the way internal reporting is being done. And this makes the internal reporting actually not terribly useful for, for marketers often. Um, and it often means that internal reports miss the value that marketing creates. So those external reporting rules that say you can't, you can't treat marketing assets as assets, well, they kind of feed through to the internal reporting rules. And so we get a situation where uh, people are also internally not treating marketing assets as, as assets. And so to change this, uh, we suggest marketers take control of internal reporting. What do I mean by that? Well, can marketers do it, perhaps? So let's, let's, let's address the first question, uh, the second question, maybe. Can marketers actually do this? Uh, you know, can you take control of internal reporting? And the simple answer is yes. Um, rules from bodies such as IASB or FASB, that sort of thing, are designed to standardize external reporting, but explicitly do not interfere with internal reporting. They're not about internal reporting. So essentially, um, you can pretty much do what you like with internal reporting. If you're a manager and you find a, a format helpful, use that format. Um, so you can adopt any approach to give you the information to do your job properly. And so what we're going to suggest is that marketers establish marketing accounts, essentially a way of looking at and understanding the value that marketing is bringing to a firm. Um, and there's a couple of sort of key um, things to say. There's a whole bunch of rules I talked through. But the, the, the first thing is that these are internal use only. So it completely uh, gets away from worries about what IASB need and what external stakeholders need. These are not designed to be given to external stakeholders. In fact, they should never be given to external stakeholders. Um, so just bear that in mind. These are purely for internal use. So quite often we, we might get someone saying, you know, you can't do this because you might, you might mislead investors uh, by putting in something that seems, um, you know, harder to value. And, you know, marketing is very hard to value. Uh, but our point is, really, don't show it to the external stakeholders at all. You know, these are purely to help managers make better decisions. Um, so these marketing accounts are internal use, and they're designed to record the, the value of assets the marketing actions generate. So how do we suggest to account for marketing? So we suggest that a set of internal marketing accounts, essentially a view of the firm from a marketing perspective, should have the following characteristics. It should capture the value of market-based assets. A market-based asset is just the sort of posh um, academic speak for asset to do with marketing. So we're talking uh, brands, customer relationships, that sort of thing, distribution type stuff, um, assets. Um, second thing is treat marketing as an investment wherever appropriate. So, you know, not, not the direct mail piece, but the brand building uh, advertising should be treated as an investment. Uh, be based on expected value. So a lot of accounting is based upon sort of conservative assumptions. Uh, we don't see the need for conservative assumptions. We actually 
um, expected value is generally a, a better decision making uh, process. So think about what you actually you know, expect to see, not worst case scenario. Um, aim only to aid management, not investor decision making. Um, so again, I want to be very clear, this is never shown to, uh, this should never get in the hands of an investor. Um, vary between but not within firms. Um, so the very between means that each firm's unique. There's no reason why every firm needs to come up with the same uh, ways of valuing marketing assets. Uh, but within the firm, it needs to be a clear way. You know, every department can't have their own uh, methods or else uh, that would, uh, people would be hard to, to judge what's going on at the firm level. Uh, comprehensive and regular. Um, so we think the marketing reports need to come out regularly and be, cover everything. Um, and to be controlled by marketers. And so, so I like to think of marketing accounts as a way of giving the CMO power. You know, the CMO gets a full view of what's going on in the organization. It's not always great for the CMO because the more power you give the CMO, I mean, clearly if, you're, um, if things aren't going well, then uh, the CMO has got fewer avenues to, to complain. Um, you know, it essentially gives the CMO tools the CMO needs to do the job. Uh, but then, of course, makes the CMO responsible for any outcomes or more responsible for any outcomes. So conclusion of the next steps, how are we doing for time? Let's see. Okay, good. I think we're doing pretty well on time. So uh, I'm going to start wrapping up. So conclusion of the next steps. Um, Marketing is often poorly measured by marketers. The solution is to choose appropriate me measures, metrics. Be careful, others using a metric doesn't make it correct. People make mistakes. I'm gonna suggest the weighter model as I, I looked earlier. So what metrics to use. Do understand all the metrics you're using. Do go to the common language marketing dictionary and please use that. Suggest any definitions if some are missing or see if you see any problems with them. Read on, may, you know, even and buy if you wish to our marketing metrics book we won't complain um marketing varies often not uh, captured in financial accounts so but seek to understand financial accounting one thing marketers can do is understand it and discuss with accounting colleagues how they limit uh, estimate the value of marketing assets and uh, they won't be able to change their financial accounting process overnight but it might help them realize that financial accounting's got problems and it might help you better understand what's going on there and support efforts such as masbees to improve accounting for marketing um, and often, as I mentioned, marketing is often poorly reported internally. So marketers take control of market managerial accounts to produce ma marketing accounts. Um, they use expected value, aim to aid manager, not investor decision making. They record all the marketing assets, treating marketing as an investment where appropriate. This will typically show a much higher value of the firm than the book value shown on the financial accounts. But as I say, shouldn't be shown to uh, outsiders anyhow. Um, and so there's no worries about overinflating the value of a firm um, uh, in order to trick external investors. Um, but there should be regular control by marketers and very between, but not within firms. So that's it. That's my, my talk for today. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, love to have you follow me on Twitter at Neil Bendel. I have a website, neilbendel.com. Or join me on LinkedIn uh, or email me with questions, extra stuff at Neil Bendel. Uh, uh, N Bendel, sorry, at ivy.ca. Uh, and please go to Masby, the Common Language Marketing Dictionary. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, any questions? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Professor Neil. And folks, we are now open for question and answers. So if you have any questions, you can always put it in the question box or you could equally raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on the console, so please click on it if you want to speak directly with the Professor Neil. So let me go straight to the question box. We have a couple of questions uh, already posted, so let me go being the first one. Uh, Professor, why do you think marketing metrics aren't as good as they could be? I'd say there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, and coming at it from two angles, there's kind of two groups who might make them better. So marketers themselves, and I think marketers themselves often have this view of themselves as, as super creative people. And that's great, you know, it's, it's good to be a creative person. You know, occasionally I like to think of myself as moderately creative myself. Um, but sometimes they feel that sort of the numbers aren't their thing. Um, and I think that's partly because the sort of stereotype of marketing might come, you know, in the good old days being associated with advertising. Um, 
But clearly marketing is much, much, much broader than that. Uh, and, you know, most marketing jobs, you need to be good with the numbers uh, and not just flashes of genius. Um, so, so I think when we teach as academics, sometimes we don't teach numbers enough. We teach sort of concepts and just general creativity. Um, uh, when students listen, they kind of enjoy learning the concepts and creativity and sometimes don't enjoy the numbers as much. Perhaps they don't pay as much attention to that. Uh, and then when they go in the workplace, they're not as they're not as well sort of positioned to to get deeply into the numbers. The people who might want to get deeply into the numbers, accountants and sort of managerial accountants, people working with them, tend tend often not to um, have given great thought to so what marketing is really. You know, they they don't really know what a customer relationship is sometimes, or a brand, or, or whatever. Um, so the people with the number skills are often pretty. Uh, have pretty low knowledge of marketing and the people with knowledge of marketing often have pretty low number skills uh, and I'm kind of like hoping to emphasize that going forward the world would be a better place if we have many marketers who have both the knowledge of marketing and the number skills too so that, that's that's my that's my thoughts anyhow well uh, thank you very much um, let's move to another question question box uh, are there any other metrics that are misused by marketers? Uh, oh, of course. Um, <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's almost any number of them. So do please go to, there's a reference in there to our Sloan article in the, Sloan, um, uh, the MIT Sloan magazine. Um, basically, I think I can't, the initial title is like the, the metrics that marketers model. Uh, and so we went through a whole bunch of them. Um, as I say, there's several I've, I've, I've said, revenue getting confused with, with profit, CLV, uh, getting, uh, getting mistaken, the value of a like. There's a, uh, another thing, I, I personally you know, would try and argue that people need to be a bit more careful about their use of ROI, a return on investment. Um, and partly this is just for when you're communicating with your finance colleagues. Um, in, to, to marketers, ROI generally means often well often means any anything good so it's a good thing therefore it's an roi uh, and there's you know in that article we talk about how cmos say they estimate roi through customer surveys well it, you know roi return on investment has a specific financial meaning which just can't be estimated through customer surveys so a lot of cmos seem to think they can do something that just just isn't possible um, so ROI is a, an, another another good one. ROI, you know, think about the meaning of ROI, return on investment. In order to in order to assess it, you need to have a return and you need to have an investment. Um, and if you don't have a return, you don't have an investment. You can't assess ROI. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. So you know, investing in something and getting a lot of eyeballs, uh, you know, creating a lot of awareness um, is fantastic. But, you know, it's, it's hard to show ROI because, you know, the return the company's expecting is not in great awareness. The company essentially wants to achieve, you know, some sort of, um, you know, bottom line change. Um, so ROI is, is another classic one. I personally think, I mean, MPS is uh, net promoter score is, or net promoter system, perhaps to be fair, is, um, is, is, is over egg too. Uh, you know, there's a... Um, there's a, a, it's a very simple measure, which is a great, and I mean that in a very complimentary way. Simple measures are fantastic, but sometimes it's talked about as though it has magical properties, and, and that, that's, that's a bit rough. When, you know, it certainly isn't the only metric you need to know. Um, you know, you cannot run a number, or you cannot run a firm just from one number. Um, so, you know, um, there's, it's, you know, ROI, MPS, but honestly, there's almost any number of unique differences in between firms. You know, you can go into any, go into several different firms, and a what they call a metric is likely to be very different to what another firm calls a metric, and they all have their own unique, exciting differences and problems. Um, so, in some ways, you know, if anyone offline wants to send me some examples, I'm always interested to know 
but you know I, I I can look at almost any set and find problems with them. And uh, we have one last question from Mr. Abdul Kabir Jimo. The question is, how can marketing be improved in the sale of land? That's a bit industry specific, but the question has been asked if you would like to answer. So. Yeah, that, that's a fascinating question. So I, I'd preface it by saying, um, you know, I'm not a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a, 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 a land marketer. It's not my area of expertise. I, I do think just with 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 any type of um, marketing, you know, I think there's some general advice I would give, and that's sort of sit down before before you do anything, kind of sit down and think, what am I trying to do? You know, ha, ha, what's my aim here? And you know, presumably it, it might just be you know, might be selling land, and you know, it might be as simple as you know, we're trying to maximise the amount of money we get for this parcel of land. But, you know, think through and make sure you're clear and then think, you know, what your customers need. You know, why would this be helpful? And this is general advice, it's not particularly metrics advice. Uh, you know, think through what are my customers looking for? What, why would my customers want, want this? Um, but on the sort of metric side, think through how you're measuring it. Um, yeah, how you're measuring perhaps customer value. Um, so think about um, if you're selling land, clearly, you know, one parcel of land is very different to another parcel of land. That's that's my entire land expertise. But you know, I know that you know, you know, a, a place that sort of um, you know, location is obviously extremely important. So think through what are and the type of type of land itself, and you know, zoning or whatever there is. Um, so think through the value that the customers can get through it. So you know, don't just think um, I got a lot of money. Don't just perhaps measure. Uh, you know, dollars per you know per kilometer or something like that, which is you know fine, but ultimately it's it's not actually that it's not it's probably not that informative because each kilometer is different. Um, but in, instead, um, or square acre or something like that, um, what instead you should do is try and think through the particular value that you're creating for the customers and seeing how much you're getting or, or of that value and how much value you're creating. For for the customers to try and get a better understanding of that um, it's kind of a probably useful way of looking at it and I would you know I'll hop back to my um, to my waiter model um, you know obviously the gentleman will have specific knowledge of the industry but go through that that model and think about sort of you know who who uses this metric you know you know who are they and that will make a big difference. What are the assumptions behind it, if anything? I mean, if it's if it's um, some metrics are very simple, don't have terribly hard assumptions. But you know, make sure you understand them. You know, what are the ingredients? Why do we think it's important? The theory, and you know, what we're going to do with it once we cut it. So once you start sort of getting um, uh, getting metrics, uh, then understand what you're trying to do with them. So I'd say that in general, um, use you know, use you can use the uh, you can use the weighter model that I'm, I'm suggesting here. How's that? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Neil. That really brings us towards the end of the webinar. Any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss that? No, no just a tiny, you know, say thank you for your attention. Uh, I, I appreciate it. Um, uh, having you on the call i hope you've enjoyed it do please uh, feel free to um contact me or you know as i say i've got all my details there so do uh do do pop on um you know, go to my website follow me on twitter linkedin or but uh, definitely go to masby find out more about them as well so thank you very much for your time well thank you very much once again i really want to thank you on behalf of the medina institute for leadership and entrepreneurship for taking the time to deliver this live webinar with us. So thank you very much once again, Professor Neil Manley. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar. We are recording it. Please stay tuned to webinar.mile.org to learn about our upcoming programs and to equally access the recorded version. With that note, I would like to end and conclude. So you all have a good day, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling from. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much.